Okay, here are the answers to the summer uh, year nine end of year, exa um, yeah, end of year examination. And I'm going to lead you through them quickly to show you how you get the right answers. Okay, first of all, what do we have here? We have, um, this is the topic of oscillations, a wave machine moving up and down. Uh, the rubber duck feels the waves that are created later on. And it asks for which arrow represents the, which does A represent? A is the wavelength between two repeating points. Uh, it could be across there, it could be across there, or even it could be from the midpoint through to the next midpoint. So that is the wavelength. Um, however, the next one asks what arrow B represents. Now remember, that is the rest position of the water. The water rests like that, and it goes up and down. So amplitude is the measure of its displacement from its equilibrium. So therefore, what does B represent? Well, it's double the amplitude. So I imagine most people would have tripped up and guessed uh, the amplitude. Okay, moving swiftly on, it says, by using the information, uh, work out the wavelength of the wave. Well, we know that we have, how many waves do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight wavelengths in 20 meters. So therefore, we have 20 meters in total divided by eight wavelengths. And that gives us a grand total of, what's that, about 2.5 meters is lambda. Good, I hope all the uh, wave theory knowledge is coming flooding back to us. <clears throat> the next one asks for the machine uh, generates frequency of two hertz. A, a, a really good way of um, of going back to these questions is it's underlying the important information here. So therefore, the frequency is 2 hertz count the period of the wave. Well, you should be able to recall straight away this equation. The time period is 1 over the frequency. So therefore, simply 1 over 2 gives us a grand total of 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.5 seconds. <clears throat> Don't leave it as a fraction, leave it as a decimal. We have one mark for the equation, one for substitution, one for answer, and one for the units, four in total. Okay, the speed of the wave. So once again, the speed is the important part here. Look above of all the information we've got. We've got the frequency and we've got the wavelength. So therefore, remember this equation, V is F times lambda. And that gives us, take the information we've got, which is 2 and 2.5. And that should give us a grand total of 1.25 meters per second. Again, tick for the, uh, for the equation, tick for the substitution, and the error carried forward will be used here. So if you got that bit wrong, then that's okay to use, but hopefully you won't. Answer and unit. Good. Okay, the next one says he places the, <coughs> he places the rubber duck near the wave machine. He notices that it rises and falls, that it oscillates. <coughs> He doubles the frequency of the machine, so this moves twice as fast. What happens to the effect of the period of the duck's oscillation? <clears throat> well, you can either think about this intuitively, that if the frequency of the number of cycles per second, if you double the frequency, <clears throat> then you'll get twice as many in a second, so the time period should half. However, if you want to do it in terms of an equation, you can say to yourself, what happens to the time period? Well, that's 1 over f. So if the bottom part of this fraction is doubled, then that means the time period is halved. So the time period is halved. And it's just one mark if you understood that. Okay, moving straight on. Um, so burglars in a garden, night camera in the garden. What sort of... Um, Electromagnetic waves that the body is burglar emit. Well, you should just know that they are infrared waves. Heat. Infrared waves are how heat is given out, and obviously bodies give out heat. If the burglar wants to reduce the amount of thermal radiation, <clears throat> what are they going to do? Well, there were so many fun answers that came up with this one. However, what we're trying to do here is reduce the infrared. 
So what could you do? So you could either uh, cover themselves in foil. Uh, you could wear white because white surfaces emit less than dark surfaces. If it were indoors, you could even increase the temperature of the room until it was greater than the body temperature. Because remember, you know, a body only emits heat. Only, em sorry, let me just read that. Bodies take in and give out heat. If the giving out is greater than the um, taking in, then they emit. Whereas if it's in a hotter environment, then this won't take in as much and it'll look cool. So you're just trying to think of how to reduce this aspect. And I think the obvious one is thinking about thermal radiation and the surfaces of the thermal radiation. Okay, gamma rays and microwaves. Uh, an obvious similarity is their speeds because they're both electromagnetic waves and therefore travel at the speed of light. And a difference is their frequency. That's the obvious one. Make it easy for the examiner. Or even the wavelength, because wavelength and frequency are linked. Make it very easy. Remember those ones. They're easy, really easy to get marks for. Okay, well now we're talking about sound. It's beyond the upper end of human hearing. What's the frequency? You should just know. 20,000 hertz, because human hearing runs between 20,000 and 20 hertz. Facts to know. Frequency and amplitude too low. Describe what you what is heard when it increases the amplitude and then the frequency. So what you're trying to do here is draw uh, the similarities between amplitude and volume. So amplitude and volume are linked. Greater amplitude, greater volume, and vice versa. The same with frequency and pitch. Higher frequency, higher pitch, and vice versa. Those are where the marks came from, drawing those analogies. <clears throat> All right, we're on to question three. Um, what does e right? So we're talking about a, um, a rocket on a launch pad. What does equilibrium mean? Well, equilibrium just means that the forces on the body are balanced, or there's no resultant force. Either of those would have got you the mark. You then had to um, draw what's taking place as it approaches the surface. Now, let's be careful with this one. Here is the surface, the Martian surface, and it's already on its way down. So it is moving in this direction. And it wants to de-accelerate. Now, what do forces cause? Forces cause changes in speed. So what's happening here? Well, if it's going that way, you want to change its speed in that direction. So there must be a resultant force upwards to change its speed. That's the resultant, but it will have some weight because it's coming near to an, a, a surface. So it will have a weight, the force of gravity exerted. But you want that much resultant force, so you need to have this much given out by the thrust from the rockets. So the difference will give you that upward resultant force. So what we're looking for here is we're looking for uh, labeling. You want the, um, the arrow length, which is important. And then finally, <coughs> you were looking for uh, the forces, the two forces that were present. Those are your three marks. Okay, now they've landed and they have a weight of a mass. So what's the equation that relates the two? Well, weight is mass times gravitational field strength, and it's asking for the gravitational field strength. So therefore, a bit of rearranging, G should be W over M. 165, oh, wrong way up, sorry, 61051 Newtons, 
divided by 16500 kilograms gives us 3.7 newtons per kilogram, newtons per kilogram. One for the equation, one for the substitution, one for the answer, and one for the units. There are your four marks. Okay, so moving swiftly on, let's take another look. A baby bouncer with uh, a baby in it, bouncing up and down. We first of all talk about Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is about how strings stretch, if that rings bells. And I'll just draw a stretching spring here. Small weight, larger weight. So what you say is that the force exerted on the spring is directly proportional to the extension. In other words, if you doubled the weight, so the force, this is a weight, weight is a force. If you doubled the force, then you double how far it stretch. To say that mathematically, the force equal directly proportional to the extension. That's only one mark though, that is. You need to say if it doesn't pass the elastic limit. Comes in your second mark often forgotten about. Okay, what would happen if it does exceed its elastic limit? Well, once it does, I'm sure you've seen it before, it becomes permanently deformed. Or, if you like, it doesn't go back <coughs> to original length. So either of those would have got you the mark. Okay, now we have, um, now we're looking at the graph, and it's asking us to, as, the, as it extends, we have our force and our extension. Remember, our extension is, well, uh, okay, then I won't say, no, we'll miss that bit out. This is um, independent, that's dependent. They've been shown the other way around, because then, the gradient of your line will be your spring constant. So, but actually, they should be the other way around if we're the infinity. But we're not checking that bit in this question. So it says, add the following to the graph. The line of best fit. Well, I'm going to write with a ruler, but I'm not going to use that. It should be going through these points neatly. And then we'll notice it's starting to bend off. On a ruler, it's much more obvious, but it's somewhere around here, it's starting to curve off. So this is the elastic limit. Now, we actually worked out, um, we actually looked for a specific point there, but um, with a ruler, it's much more easier to see. So I will jump past that point. What about a stiffer spring? Well, a stiffer spring would actually be up here. And the reason why you know that's a stiffer spring is obviously gradient issues, but also this. If you put a hundred and say a hundred newtons on this spring, this one stretches by six, whereas this one stretched by about what that one, two, three, thirteen. So therefore for the same weight force, you're getting a less of an extension here. So therefore it must be stiffer. Okay, use the graph to determine extension caused by the baby. Well, the baby is 18 kilograms and you're looking for the extension. It's a few steps here, maybe a few more lines might have given that away. But that being 18 kilograms, which is the mass, is actually 180 newtons. Remember, weight is mass times g, g being 10 newtons per kilogram. So therefore, what you're looking for is 180, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, there is 180. Taking that across, if I've drawn the line correctly, I'm coming down to this point here, 
which is approximately 23 centimeters of extension. I think it's meant to be 25. It depends upon how straight and how good that line is. Mine's that it's dodgy there, so apologies if that doesn't match exactly mark scheme. <clears throat> okay, now F. This one was tricky. Norman does not think that the real ATIC should be allowed to bounce in. He thinks it would break the elastic limit. Is he right or not? Well, if the baby on its own, box is the baby, B, was on its own, then the extension would be within the elastic limit of about 30. So that is okay. But what do babies do? Well, they bounce up and down. So therefore, if this were bouncing up and down, you might hit a point that is greater than the elastic limit. So the first of all is a still baby doesn't seed limit. A bouncing baby might. Okay, bit of a tricky question that one. Right, here we go then. Next question dealing with crane, climbing a crane, We're dealing with energy conservation here. So all those three equations of GPE, KE, work done ought to spring to mind. First one was straightforward. Um, the energy value written on the box is how much energy does she consume in joules? She eats the box of raisin. Right, 170 kilo. Remember, kilo, you multiply by 1,000. Straightforward. Hopefully you all got that mark. How far vertical up the crane should have to climb to do this? That far vertically, energy, and you have a weight up here, sorry, a mass up there, so how high would it be? Well, we need to use one of our equations, which we learned. GPE is MGH. H is GPE over MG. Now, the energy available is going to be 17023, given in this bit of equation here. The mass is 50, and G is 10, which leads us to 340 meters. So total energy available from the food will be converted into GPE, assuming nothing is lost to frictional gravity, uh, friction. So therefore, we get one mark for the, using the right equation, uh, yep. one mark for the correct substitution, one mark for the answer, and one for the unit. Good. What about the power, time, energy? Well, once again, look at the equation. Power is work done divided by the time. Work done is the same way, another way of saying the energy transferred. So this is 5600. Zero, zero divided by 25, all of them are given in the correct units, so that's straightforward. 2, 4, 2, 2, 4, what's Equation, substitution, answer, units, there are your four marks. Okay, now we're looking at how much energy is being um, graphically in a Sankey diagram. How much energy is being supplied by the fuel? Well, this, we know what this is, 600. And you can see that there's this one large block of five, another block of five, and one. So we have 12 squares representing 600. So therefore, 600 over 12 gives us, it's about 50 per square. Remember, these are to scale. So therefore, if I look across here, I've got one, two, three, four, lots of five, that's 20 squares by 50 per square gives me 1,000 joules. Hopefully, straightforward. Uh, what forms, right, every time you get a question like this, it's always heat and sound. Energy is wasted most often through friction that creates heat and sound. 
Okay. Efficiency is the useful energy divided by the total energy times 100. So let's look what's been usefully used. Usefully is going to be the 600 divided by the 1000 which we used times 100 gives us 60 percent. Equation, substitution, answer, unit. The percent is important there. Though you could write a 0 0.6 as a ratio, we want them to prefer them as percentages there. Okay, lightning quick tour continues. Number six talks about particles. Uh, which one is a liquid? Well, Z, just something to learn. They're not regularly placed. Gases, liquids. X, because they're moving around, and they're not held down by gravity, they're not touching each other, they're, they're gases. And in a gas, the particles are moving randomly. Not moving implies that there is zero Kelvin. Vibrating in a fixed position implies they're solid, so moving randomly. Um, considering what happens to the particles in a beaker of water upon heating from room temperature. Now, temperature is how much one particle is vibrating. So temperature, put this as an aside, is the average kinetic energy of one particle. It's important. Of course, this one might be moving slightly different speed to this one. So what you do is you look at you find the average kinetic energy of just one of the particles. Now, what does that mean? If you are, if the a beaker of water is being heated, so therefore you're going to say that the particles move around more, vibrate faster, of course, kinetic energy is movement energy. It's a mark in for that. And then the next one implying that they spread out. The space in between them increases. And that's due to them vibrating faster. Hence, particles or substances expand when heating. Okay, now we're looking at data, data for you to analyse. Um, it's all being done here for you, and the averages have been supplied. Um, Martin wants to do the experiment just once, but Mina insists that the repeats are done. What would that do? It improves the accuracy. Accuracy means, if you think of a dartboard, terrible dartboard, but there we go. Accuracy implies how close these readings are put together and how close they are imagine you're trying to get to the bullseye so how close they are getting to that bullseye the bullseye being your true value so accuracy is how close you are to that point if you do repeats then you're more likely to be closer to your true value good um, there was I'm not sure I've got a chance to do the, uh, the graph, but should I tell you where the marks were given, I will quickly sketch something out. But um, essentially, the axes um, labelled axes labelled plus units one big mark you got. Then the scale was important. You wanted it to be spread out as far across the, um, the paper as possible. The line of best fit was important. You didn't just join the dots, but you're looking for a trend. And then the points, making sure that you accurately point to the, point to the points. So you were generally looking for something that looked like this. It would have been you know, one axis here, which would mean temperature in degrees C. We've got another one along here, 
because you want the time in seconds. Now remember here, this is what you were controlling. That's what you measured, hence dependent measured. Whereas independent, you changed. And then once you've got some points in, you want a line of best fit. Do not, but joining the dots is not very, it's not good practice. Do not do that. Because in physics, you're looking for underlying trends. You're not looking just to connect the dots and assume that nothing's happening in between. You're looking for an underlying trend. Okay, I've scribbled through that quickly, but it takes a long time to plot, and I'm conscious that we don't have that much time in the video. Right, but at least you know where the marks were given for, and what they were given for. Okay, but describe how the changes of time. So, from that graph, temperature decreases as time increases. So temperature decreases as time increases. Okay, first mark. But then you have to say something a little bit more sophisticated about it. For instance, that it, uh, it decreases at a faster rate initially. The rate is faster there. Or that because it is flat, it reaches thermal equilibrium. So then, initially, at a faster rate or thermal equilibrium is reached. Yeah. Okay, a big wordy question here. I'm going to squeeze it all into here and explain where the marks were given. Essentially this one. You needed to comment on the silvered surfaces reflect radiation. That was important. Marx came for saying that the silver surface reflects radiation. The vacuum came to say that conduction and convection, both of them, convection re reduced as there are no particles. No particles. Mark, mark. Remember, inside here, inside this vacuum, there are no particles. Conduction and convection require either vibrations to bump into neighbouring atoms and pass them on conduction, or convection, heat up in one place and move to another place. So with no particles, you can't achieve those. Okay, the stopper or the cap at the top, this bit here. How does that stop things? Well, it prevents hot air rising or even evaporation. And there was one mark for spelling, punctuation, and grammar, how well it had been written. So one, two, three, four, five, six major points that you needed to pull together. And it was marked based on interpretation, but that essentially is what you need. I'm sure there is another important point which was credited, which is um, these surfaces could be plastic, and plastics are poor conductors, but it's not a major point because there are some thermos flasks nowadays which are made of metal. So these are the important major points. Good, nearly there. Okay, what fraction is lost per year? Well, a fraction implies, okay, what's lost uh, through the roof. So it's 150 through the roof divided by, well, all of the rest put together. The total, 150 plus 109 plus, so that one done, that one done, that one done. Floor, 75 plus 66, which in actual fact gives us 150 over 600, I think that comes to, which then gives us a grand total of a quarter. So a quarter is what's lost. 
Okay, now if you if you know that 760 is being lost totally, then a quarter of it, or 190, is being lost through the roof. Okay. Only th right. So that if you now were to install insulation in the roof, you could save fifty percent of that. So one hundred and ninety over two gives us ninety-five pounds. So each year you would save ninety-five pounds. Now, after a year and a half, you can pay back for lost loft insulation. So ninety-five by one point five gives us one hundred and forty-two point five pounds. And that must be the cost of the loft insulation if you're paying it back in a year and a half. So one, two, three months. Okay, static electricity. Polythene rod becomes negatively charged, so this is becoming negative to explain how this happens. Really importantly with um, static electricity is you need to understand it's the electrons that are moving. So you've got electrons that are moving onto the rod. So we need to make sure that electrons are being transferred. One mark. And the direction which is happening. And it goes from the cloth to the rod. Therefore the rod gains electrons. <laughs> Hence it's negative. The important point here is that the protons don't move, but we're coming on to a question that asks that. Okay, now as this polythene rod brought near to the um, balance, we're getting an increase in reading. Noted. There's an increase in reading. Why is that? Well, very simply, it's because we have the rods are repelling and why is that? Because they have the same charge. Remember, opposites attract like repel. And as you move them closer, so the closer the rods, the greater the repulsion. Mm. That's why the force increased. Okay, here we have a conductor, and you can see that the positive negatives are equally distributed, so therefore, this is a neutral, it has a neutral charge overall. They all cancel each other out. However, when we, um, when we bring a negative charge object near, Interestingly, this is the important point, first of all, the protons do not move. And that's where the first mark comes from. However, the electrons are able to move. So they definitely, they move away from this zone, so the electrons move. Uh, why does it change in this way? Well, like charges repel. Electrons repel. But importantly here, protons don't move. And that's where the two marks come. And then it says, well, interestingly, um, you will have, there'll be an attraction here, but there will also be a repulsion between those two. Why is the force of attraction larger? Well, electrons are further away. Protons are nearer. So it's drawing that first part of the question back again. The protons here are nearer the electrons, so this force of attraction is greater than the repulsion going on between these and those. It's quite common. Okay, last question. Here we go. What's happening here? It's asking for um, the bulb's not bright enough to increase the bulb. Right. 
So what you need to do is, this is definitely wrong because these are the wrong way around, so that actually does nothing for the bulb. We do have this setup which is in parallel, but that doesn't add any current to it, that just increases how long the battery lasts. This one similarly uh, won't do anything to increase the current, this one will because both batteries are pushing in the same direction, so the answer is A. What does 0 0.5 amps mean? Right. I was looking for 0 0.5 coulombs per second move around the circuit. Coulombs per second. <coughs> you could have said charge or even rate of flow of charge. That would have been okay. But you really needed to reference the second or the rate of flow and charge. Some of you said it means that 0 0.5 is the current. That's only one mark. Okay, what was the ammeter in the original circuit E? So now we're coming up to this one here. I needed to see a reference to one bulb equals half the resistance. So therefore the current doubles. It gives us one amp. Okay, now, lots of us tripped up here. Let's just go back to what's important here. The one amp there implies that that which is coming through each of these is one amp. Because what we're saying is this, is, you know, this one is one amp. Now, what happens is, oh, sorry, wrong way around. The coulomb, as it comes out of the battery here and goes round, make it to this point, it makes a choice. It either does that, in which case it doesn't see those other two circuits, or it goes through the bottom one, it doesn't see those two circuits. So it goes through as if there was nothing else connected to it, i.e. one amp. Similarly, one amp. Similarly, one amp. So therefore, that which comes in and out of the battery must be three amps. Good. And how long would it be left on for the circuit would work for? Well, what do we say here? Now, but circuit F, importantly. So, though lots of us understood that Q is I times T, and therefore T is Q over I, lots of us put in once it's divided by, you all thought it was this figure suddenly. Look, circuit F, which is 0 0.5 amps gives us 360 seconds, or 6 minutes, though you didn't need to write that. 1, 2, 3, 4. There it is.